Hello and welcome to Popcorn Mumbles, where we dig into the back catalog to select a film or television show to rewatch. I'm your host, Cody Nestor. Alongside me is my co-host, Todd Heal. What's going on, guys? This week, we've chosen the 1971 film, Diamonds Are Forever. James Bond, equipped with an armory of high-tech gadgets, infiltrates a Las Vegas diamond smuggling ring in a bid to foil a plot to target Washington with a laser in space. However, as 007 prepares to tackle the evil Blofeld, the mastermind who threatens to destabilize the world, he is captivated by the delicious Tiffany Case, but is she really a double agent? Diamonds Are Forever was released in the U.S. on December 17, 1971. On a budget of $7 million, it made $115 million. It has a Rotten Tomato score of 64% and an audience score of 57%. So, Todd, let's discuss Diamonds Are Forever. Spoilers are ahead. Okay. So allow me to start by saying that I remember very little about Diamonds Are Forever. I thought we were getting back into this, and this was going to be one of those um, so bad it's good bonds for <laughs> right, me. Right, But this is just so bad it's bad. So for, bad it's bad. For me. So, Todd, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you uh, to start. Coming back to Diamonds Are Forever, give us your opening thoughts then versus now. Uh, then, uh, even back then, this was always on my, my bottom, especially of the Conneries and probably of the entire series. And looking back now, it's, it's still there. And uh, I found this funny little, uh, little tidbit. Uh, I was searching for this film on streaming to try to watch it. And, uh, some of these are on Max. Some of these are on Amazon Prime. I didn't have any luck on Max, <clears throat> so I went to Prime. Uh, it was on there, but it was for rent or buy. You know, it wasn't available as part of Prime. So I just kind of clicked on the description. And you know how, you know, films will have like, you know, like the release date and like action adventure, uh, drama, comedy, mm -hmm. whatever. Well, Diamonds Are Forever had a, a four word description, and I thought it was very appropriate before we, where we are right now. Okay. Uh, it says, uh, <laughs> suspense. That mm -hmm. was the first one. Uh, Maybe. All right. Okay. Sure. Adventure. Yeah. Okay. Mysterious. Not really. Okay. And here's the last one that really got me. Outrageous. That's true. That's <laughs> so true. So that's where we are now, and I think that's where we're headed with, you know, different levels of success all the way through to 1985's A View to a Kill. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we, uh, we started with Dr. No, and now here we are with Sean Connery's final canonical Appearances Bond. Yeah, final official yeah, appearances Yeah, he'll come back bond. again eventually in 1983 uh, with uh, Never Say Never Again. But again, canonical, official Bond. This is Connery's last outing. And boy, it's uh, it's a sad effort, I think, on almost everybody's part. Right. It's a shame. Uh, especially we covered uh, uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service last week. And to go from On Her Majesty's, I knew it was going to be a drop. You're right. I didn't think it would sink like a fucking stone like this, and it really does. I I really loved it. The more I think about On Her Majesty's, like, the more I like it. The more you it. loved it. And then just to go to this, and then everything that happened in On Her Majesty's really, it's, it's, it's looked over. There's no mention of Teresa Bond, which we already knew we were getting into. That yeah. wasn't happening or anything like that. So... It just it's it's just kind of sad all the way around. It's Bond's final appearance, and this is what you kind of get to uh, to kind of cap off the Sean Connery era, right? Before going into the Roger Moore era, which isn't much better in my opinion. <laughs> it has some highlights. I'm not going to say it's all bad, but true, true. Uh, just some book information. Diamonds Are Forever is the fourth novel and eleventh book in Ian Fleming's James Bond series. So, Todd, uh, tell us what is James Bond's assignment this time around? So basically, he starts out. Uh, it's uh, he's investigating diamond smuggling, and he actually winds up uh, on a trail that leads him to Las Vegas. Yeah. He finds out his old arch nemesis Blofeld is still alive, still around. Uh, he's using those diamonds, and a, uh, a, a professor called Doctor Metz, who's like a genius in like uh, a light refraction, and uh, basically he's building building a big laser. He's going to shoot up into orbit that he can kind of like hold the world for ransom, you know, pay me X amount of dollars or Cleveland's gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds as absurd and outrageous, outrageous. As, you, as you make it sound. I mean, it starts off rough. Like, take us through the uh, the, the, pre, the, the Bond pre-title sequence. What do we get here? So this is one that always used to throw me because I used to think, well, is this picking up from Honor and Majesties? Because he's like, seems like he's hot and heavy trying to find Blofeld. But in like the most comical worst way possible yeah. yeah absolutely so blofeld is kind of like i guess he's he's still alive even if you count on her majesties even if you pick and choose he's still alive obviously at the end on her majesties you know he's 
Right, Te- right. He's Telly Savalas in his neck brace. Um, and he is still alive, and we get him here, and it looks like he his part of his uh, – his time in between films, if you were to count them, is that he's been uh, turning other goons of his, I guess, or volunteers, as he calls them, into Blofeld through, I guess, plastic surgery. Right. Some type of hot mud bath. Some plastic. kind of mud bath thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, Charles Gray is in this time as Blofeld. Our third different Blofeld third, in, in three movies. Yeah, <laughs> almost as many changes as Felix Leiter in this series, which we do get a new Felix Leiter, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, but, yeah, we get a new Blofeld here. Our third, as you mentioned, Donald Pleasance in for We Only Live Twice, out. Telly Savalas in for Honor Majesties, out. Out. And then Charles Gray comes in for this one, and I think he is definitely – I like Charles Gray, but definitely the weakest. The of, weakest of the three, Of yeah. the three, for sure. So what's going on in this uh, in the, the the pre-title sequence? So like I say, uh, blonde, blonde, Bond is <laughs> searching. James Bond, Bond. James Bond. Uh, Bond is searching for Blofeld. Uh, he walks up on this guy. You know, he kind of just you know throwing him throwing him around like where's Blofeld? You mm-hmm. know, he gives him a location. He goes to a guy in the casino. The guy's sitting there and he's like. Hit me, you know, just wanting to hit in the cards, but James gives him a chop right in the face. <laughs> yeah, like he, he beats up he beats up that Asian guy and he asks yeah. where Blofeld is and he's like Cairo, but he yeah. doesn't say Cairo. Yeah. Some ADR line that's put in later says right. Cairo. It's all rough. It's like a it's like a fan film about James Bond is how it starts because <laughs> you don't see Connery. They're like kind of teasing it, I yeah. guess. And it just it makes me sick almost. The guy like, in the game. <laughs> So the guy in the casino sends him to see some girl. Uh, James goes to see her. We finally see Sean introduced proper, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, he kind of proceeds to take the girl's bikini to hop off and choke her with it. Yeah. Like, where is Blofeld? Another nipple slit. Yeah. Yeah, another another one of those quick uh, Bond franchise uh, nipple inclusions. There's a few in this film. In the actual film, I noticed. Oh, yeah. More than just one, the pre-title. There was, there was yeah. one in on, on Her Majesty's I didn't notice till I was uh, just looking at um, – uh, some of the stuff for this to make sure I wasn't crazy, and I was I kind of found an article about like all the different like slips and stuff. Yeah, there was one in on Her Majesty's I didn't notice of uh, what's the girl, the one that's uh, she's allergic to chicken. Oh yeah, like, her whole boob is out, and I didn't even notice. Wow. Like in like one part. But, yeah, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'll revisit that on my <laughs> own time. So James actually does track down Blofeld, as you say, he's in the process of turning one of his henchmen into one of uh, his clones in yeah. some kind of mud bath type scenario. Now this this really chaps my ass. <laughs> so like it, it his uh, one of his one of his henchmen like that that's getting his plastic surgery. He's in this mud bath. Uh, he's covered. Bond kind of comes in. You see the guy. He's in the bath. He kind of raises his little pistol up. He's going to kill Bond. Bond does a half-ass old man roll across <laughs> the room and hits a lever, which releases more mud on top of this guy. Mm. My problem is that mud bath is three feet high. <laughs> he could have stood up. up. Stand up. <laughs> he could have stood up. He could have got right out of the tub. He literally just lays there and drowns for no reason right. because the script said he needed to. The whole thing is just awful. I guess Blofeld eventually comes in, shows Bond kind of what's going on. He's uh, they try to take his gun. He gets a mouse trap, <laughs> a hand mouse trap. <laughs> Dude, the guy tries to, the goon tries to take his gun and gets a, a fucking Bond Q gadget mouse trap stuck onto his fingers. I'm like, what are we doing? And it's just filmed. The whole thing is filmed so awkwardly, and it just does not. There's not been a Bond pre-title sequence that I've really disliked before. This one's the first one I've really disliked. Yeah, this is probably the worst one so far. Yeah, it feels disjointed. It feels too rushed. It just feels like, well, we got to do something, and we got to kind of, like, Blofeld's got to be involved, and... It just it's just very sloppy, I guess is how it right. is. It's just very sloppily executed all on all fronts, pretty much. Um and I mean he eventually I guess puts Blofeld on some type of gurney. Gurney and slings him into the mud bath. Yeah, and what does he tell him? Welcome to hell, Blofeld. And then uh, opening titles. Yes. How we've t- kind of talked about pretty much most of the opening titles here. Um uh, Shirley Bassey is back. Yeah. For her third time. I think she's the only uh, musician in the Bond film history that's done that many. I think so. Yeah. Multiple songs in the film series. What do you think about the opening credits in terms of what we see visually and the song that we get? I like the song. It's probably my my second favorite. Shirley Bassey, of course, Goldfinger being my number one. But uh, as far as what we actually see, I mean, it, it's okay. Yeah. It's nothing. It's nothing. You know, it's gonna knock your socks off. It also feels, and that's a problem I think with this movie overall. It is a very. It feels very cheap. 
And I, I think I have a note about that that kind of can help explain that a little bit. But, yeah, we kind of transitioned from Blofeld's Cat's Diamond Encrusted Collar to those opening credits. And they're just very forgettable. Yeah. Like this film, very forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where do we go from there? Pick us up from there, Todd. So we're, we're back in England. Uh, uh, M and James are getting ready to have a meeting with, uh, I forget the gentleman's name. He's kind of like a diamond expert. Mm -hmm. Like we had the gold expert in Goldfinger. Yeah. We have a diamond expert here. Exactly. And he's kind of telling Bond and M about how, you know, most of your world's diamonds come from South Africa and mm -hmm. how, you know, security's tight, but it ain't that tight. Some some slip through. And some, we're seeing, like, kind of cutaways yeah. to how things are slipping through. There's the these diggers for these diamonds are, like, putting them in, pretending they're their teeth or slipping one into their shoe, those kind of things. Like security, not that tight in the right. diamond smuggling world. We see one of them go to a dentist and the dentist removes a diamond from his mouth, mm -hmm. kind of wraps up some currency and a little thing, hands it to him, you know. Uh, in that little meeting uh, between Bond and him and the, the, the diamond expert, uh, there's a kind of an offhand line about um, – uh, M and his liver because he doesn't partake in the uh, the drinking. Right. Uh, I guess M's liver is dying. <laughs> I think Bernard Lee. I didn't. I don't think he survived many more years after this film. No, he was into the more era, but not far. Not I don't far, think. Yeah, you can kind of tell his age is starting to definitely kind of catch up with him and a lot in the series, but still. And I, but I still enjoy the banter back and forth between. It's he a still lot. loves giving 007 down the road. Yeah. <laughs> is there anything you're not an expert in 007? <laughs> that kind of thing. Yeah. So. So what you're talking about there in terms of that um, that dentist passing those diamonds, he, he sends the diamonds, the money, all this stuff. So we see kind of differently from, I guess, other Bond films. You kind of see how the, in, the, the plot is working in terms of the villain's plot because you, get, you follow these diamonds. Right. Every time these diamonds switch hands. You're with them. You're with them, and then that person ends up getting killed by a Mr. Went. And Mr. Kidd. And a Mr. Kidd. So these are our two, I guess, these are our big henchmen of the film. Right. These are our, instead of odd job, we've got two odd jobs, I guess, so to speak, in this film. And uh, very, very interesting gentlemen, I would very, say. Very, very interesting. I would say. they, uh, they in, The first kill I think we get from them in the film is uh, them using a scorpion. Down the dentist's back. Down yeah. the dentist's back. I think I originally read the... Originally, it was scripted as he would, he would I think, Mr. Uh, Went. Went is the non-bald one. Kid is the bald one, right. the red-headed bald one. Uh, he was going to stick the scorpion in his mouth, and I guess it was deemed too... Uh, too shocking. Too shocking, okay. yes. Too mysterious, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> mysterious? <laughs> yeah. Outrageous? So they off the dentist, but you do kind of see a lot more um, from the villain side of things here than you do with previous Bond films. It's just usually Bond... What's going on? Bond goes to location and starts to unravel the plot a little bit. You kind of do see it building throughout the film, which mm -hmm. is, I guess, a little bit of a credit I'll give to it. Right, right. Compared to what we've kind of seen before. We should mention Guy Hamilton is back for this. Guy Hamilton come in for Goldfinger, made arguably the best or second best, in my opinion, Bond right. film ever made. He left again and then comes back for this. Uh, one of the worst Bond films I think <laughs> made. It's not at the bottom, but we're we're getting there. Right. You made it a, a great analogy before we uh, started the podcast about how this was like a family reunion. You want to explain that? <laughs> oh, I, you know, as far as my love of the series, you know, I say I love them all. It's like a family reunion. You got those ones that you look forward to going and seeing. You got those ones that you, you don't mind seeing, and you got those ones you just kind of tolerate while they're there. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely the latter. This film is definitely the latter. <laughs> Uh, so Bond uh, jets off to Holland. So what happens in Holland, Todd? So he's going to Holland. Uh, they've uh, found out about a, a diamond smuggler over there by the name of Peter Franks. Uh, Bond kind of takes his uh, role. He takes on the role of Peter Franks. He's over there to meet uh, a fellow diamond smuggler accomplice by the name of Tiffany Case. Mm -hmm. On, in, it, in our introduction to Holland and Amsterdam, you get some good shots, beautiful, beautiful, you know, locations, again, like the Bond film the franchise in general. But I love the little, there's like a tourist boat oh, yeah. out in the canal, <laughs> mm -hmm. and there's like, I think, a female tour guide. And she's like, if you look on your right, you'll see these beautiful vistas and all this. If you look on the left, there's an old lady's body being drugged out of the canal. Yeah. So the old lady is kind of set up before. She's another one in the chain of the diamonds that Mr.
Minister went, Mr. Right. Kid. She's running some kind of school where she helps or teaches children. Yeah, yeah. And they end up murdering this old lady because she's involved with those diamonds yeah. in some form or another, getting them into the hands of the person they're supposed to go to or who we, we think that they're going to for a little while, but not so much. Uh, so Tiffany Case, tell us about what goes on at Tiffany Case's little apartment. So Bond, a.k.a. Peter Franks, he actually mm. make it, makes it to Tiffany's place. And uh, when he comes in, she's a blonde. Uh, mm -hmm. At one time, she's a brunette, and mm -hmm. then she finally shows her true colors, which was a redhead. Yes. And uh, she kind of, you know, she's suspicious, so she uh, kind of lifts some fingerprints off of uh, Peter Frank's or Bond's glass that mm -hmm. she offers him a drink. And she's got, like, this whole fingerprint set up in her wardrobe. <laughs> yeah, I was like, we're really just getting into this super spy sp stuff, right? right? Like, she's got, not only can she, you know, she's she's dusting his fingerprints, sure. I was like, okay, what are you going to do with them? But she's got a, a fingerprint camera. And then that system transfers to her fingerprint reading wardrobe. <laughs> and then she identifies that it is Peter Franks. And I'm like, how, how, how are you even doing that? Yeah, how did he get by that? And then we see kind of a, a little bit later in that scene that Bond has been given, I guess, by Q Branch, uh, fake fingernails. Or fingernails. F fingerprints. Fingerprints, yeah. <laughs> He could have given, given fake fingernails, fingernails are too. still his. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fake fingerprints. Right. Uh, it really it gave me uh, Robin's uh, rubber lips vibes from oh, Batman yeah. and Robin. Right, it right. Gave me, it gave me rubber lips vibes, but yeah. Uh, I mean, Tiffany Case is a character. She's, I think, um, our first American Bond girl. I think you may be right. And yeah. she's kind of, uh, you know, if you kind of look at her character, she's kind of brash and very talkative and just kind of up front and fearful a little bit like i was kind of reading a little bit about you know kind of that character and the characterization you know is that like kind of the the viewpoint of american women or american society in general but yeah. i mean she's she's prevalent throughout the film but i don't think she has too much of a character she's just kind of one of these uh bond girls that kind of like whoever's got the upper hand at that point, that's who she's with kind right, of for a little right. while. I mean, yeah. she does help Bond, but, I mean, that seems like mostly her character or girl that's in over her head a little bit. Uh, that's kind of the other, I guess, kind of uh, part of her character. And she's, uh, throughout the movie, she doesn't get to wear many clothes. Yeah, so I, I will say that for sure. Always a plus, they, I guess. They really saved on the wardrobe budget right. with uh, the character of Tiffany Case. <laughs> uh Bond is alerted that uh, the actual Peter Franks, who was kind of detained at, uh, I guess, is it like customs or a, a checkpoint or something like that right. by uh, some MI6 agents. He's actually broken free, killed one of those agents, and he's on his way to Amsterdam. So kind of Bond meets him outside. Um, did you like that little, uh, you know, uh, solo love making? Oh, I did. <laughs> I almost forgot about that. Yeah, I love Bond making out with himself to, <laughs> to not draw suspicion as he right? as he follows Peter Franks into the hotel. Who knew that bit worked so well? Yeah, exactly. Only <laughs> only Jimmy Bond can pull it off that well. But yeah, he he follows Franks in, and I'm like, what? They have this big elevator fight. Bond tries to punch him and ends up punching the glass out of the elevator. Right? Why not just take him outside? Like kill him outside, or Just like put a bullet in him outside. Do something like strangle why, him why outside. Why bring him in? Because I assume more people than Tiffany Case live in that building, right? I would assume There's so. A, it's yeah. a third floor building. She lives. She lives on the third floor. So I assume more people than her. Dude, let's. I think we could do better than trying to kill the guy on the <laughs> elevator. Make all that ruckus on that elevator, right? Let him knock on her door, and then like while he's knocking on her door, shoot him in the back of the head, right? And then drag right. him inside or something. Like it, I mean, again, it's there, so we can have an action scene. But anyway, uh, so. What, what happens from there, Todd? Pick us up. So uh, they have their fight. Uh, Bond wins. I think he actually winds up, th he throws him or he falls over the balcony with all that uh, fire extinguisher foam in his face. <laughs> Bond yeah. throws the fire extinguisher down there. It finishes foaming in his face full. <laughs> uh, he go Bond goes down and he switches wallets with the guy. Mm -hmm. James puts his wallet in his pocket and James takes Peter Frank's actual wallet. So when they're like, who is that guy? You know, Tiffany goes and gets his wallet. She opens it up and, oh, my God, you just killed James Bond. And this is another thing that Here, bugged yeah, me. Right. <laughs> how does she the fucking know who James Bond exactly. is? Exactly. At this point, is James Bond like the equivalent of a rock star? Yeah. Is he known everywhere he goes? You, oh, my God, you just 
just killed Elvis. <laughs> like, just the name alone evokes that kind of reaction from right. her. Like, I don't buy it. Like, and it's even if it is true, it's like you really need a new name. You really need to not be James Bond anymore. Right. You need to be Carl Bond <laughs> or something because obviously to be a, a, su- a super spy, mm-hmm. the spy part is a little bit of espionage, not knowing uh, people <laughs> knowing your movements and who you are. Right. Time to get a new name, I think. He's supposed to be in the British Secret Service. <laughs> not so secret. secret. He's become he's become MI6 like in name alone, just in and of himself, and it's, it's getting a little ridiculous We here. do see Bond as a member of the Playboy Club and Casino, though. <laughs> oh, I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't even yeah. pay any attention to that. Maybe I, maybe I was asleep. <laughs> um, so we get uh, another Bond girl. We, we see Bond, I think, off to the casino after this. Is that right? So they, uh, that's oh, when he, Tiffany kind of, you know, she he wants to be let in. Hey, where's the diamonds? You know, yeah. that's what he's there for, to smuggle these diamonds for her. And they're up in that chandelier in her apartment. And so yes. they get the idea of, you know, well, Peter Franks, the dead real Peter Franks, we're going to fly him back as a corpse, and the diamonds are going to be in his body that's or where, in the casket. Right, and this is a, at the airport, kind of uh, the check of the casket. This is where we meet our our very our newest Felix Leiter. Our newest Felix Leiter. He's changed, I think, actors more times than anybody in this series <laughs> and probably holds that record, I would say. Probably. Uh, our new Felix Leiter, he kind of is the one uh, that kind of takes over the investigation of the, the, the casket and the body of the dead Peter Franks and kind of lets Bond through. He also lets him know that uh, a few goons, a few very Las Vegas looking goons, very Vegas. Because that's where goons. we're at now. We're in Vegas, mm-hmm. and uh, they're gonna they're gonna pick him up. They're part of Slumber Inc. Slumber, <laughs> yeah, very good name for yeah. a mortuary, a field mortuary at least. So Morton Slumber runs more uh, runs Slumber Inc. So they pick him up, and they're like, it's very. Um, it's very uh, sketchy how they pick him. They pick him up and they're like, "Would you like to sit in the front, Mister?" You want to ride up front, Mister Franks? It's yeah, more comfortable up front, exactly. Mister Franks. So I can put a bullet in the back of your head and be like, Lee, "Take the cannolis, lead the gun." Like you know, <laughs> that's what it felt like. Are they just gonna pop this dude on the right. road and just leave the car? Right. But no, they end up taking him to Slumber Inc. And here we go again. Like uh, they go through the uh, bond, bond as Franks goes through the whole spiel of working with Morton Slumber to get the body cremated. He pretends it's his, br- his, his brother. His brother, yeah. They cremate the body. They bring him an urn full of the diamonds. Uh, he's supposed to place the diamonds in a certain part of the mortuary. He places the diamonds there and gets conked on the back of the head by one of our two henchmen. Yeah, because Wint and Kid was there. Yeah. yeah, of course they're there. They're they're everywhere in this <laughs> film. Uh, and then they place him in. This is a, another – it's a problem with the Bond series, especially the Connery films, but um, it's a problem with this film as well, Of like especially with Wint and Kid, like, just kill him. Right, Just exactly. Don't be too clever with it because they place him in the casket and they put him in the, cre- the, the the cremation, the shoot to be cremated. They activate it. He's eventually kind of let loose by, I forget the guy's name. He's like some kind of half-assed comedian. Shady Tree. He's like, yeah, it's Shady Tree. He's yeah. got that great line. I can't I can't quote it for Baden, but he like opens it up and he's like, you limey pinko bastard was real goddamn diamonds <laughs> or something like it. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Don't quote me on that, yeah, but please. it cracks me up yeah. every time. No, please quote it. Drop in the real quote. Yeah. Cody will drop in the real no, line. No, I'm, but... not gonna do it. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. There's something along those lines. It's yeah. funny as hell. Uh, yeah, they let Bond out of the 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 all too clever plot by Went and Kid to kill him, which we'll, we'll talk about that a few times throughout this film. They let him loose, and uh, at that point, that's where I got a little bit ahead. I think that we're, we're at this point. Now we're heading for the casino, right? Right. Because apparently those diamonds were fake. Yes. And so I think he has a call with Felix, and he, he, he says he needs the real stuff. Right. Right. And there's a lot of that in this. There's a lot of, like, who's really got them, where they're at. Like, mm-hmm. there's a little bit of that, like, kind of, you kind of get a little bit lost in it. But we go to the casino. Bond is doing a little gambling. He's walking around on the casino floor, and he meets our other Bond girl, Miss Plenty O'Toole. Time. Plenty O'Toole. I know you love the line. <laughs> I know you love it. Go ahead and do it. So uh, he's he's gambling there, and she's already been gambling with one guy, and he kind of loses his shirt, and he's like, well, honey, that's it. Let's go back to my place. And he's, she's like, nah, you're a real nice guy, but I'm just going to go. <laughs> she hears James of her making all these big-ass bets, like, and so she walks up to his table. And she's like, hi, just bubbly as hell. Hi, I'm Plenty. Plenty O'Toole. And at first she says, uh, he looks and he's like, obviously. Named after your father, perhaps. <laughs> Gets me every time. 
<laughs> uh, so they they have their little their 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 meet up. She ends up going up to his room. They uh, start to have a little bit of sexy time. They're interrupted by the uh, the Morton slumber goons. The goons. Uh, they chuck her out of the uh, the window <laughs> in nothing but her uh, very sheer panties. Uh, Bond has a good line with him, and he's like, you know, the the, the little the kind of goon guy. He's like, I didn't know there was a pool there. <laughs> He's like, he's like, nice shot. He's like, I didn't think it was a pool there. <laughs> I was like, what was your plan? Was you really just going to kill this girl and then them not figure out what floor she came from? Just start, chuck her out on the sidewalk? I guess. And then just start like having some kind of big police investigation. But oh well. Uh, but yeah, plenty of tool. Uh, very, very throwaway Bond girl character. Really, she gets uh, two scenes, I guess. She gets this one and her murder. Yep. She <laughs> shows up again in another pool. Yeah, in yeah. another pool. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, I guess this really just kind of sets up more. I mean, what is even the point of this whole get scene with the goons? Really, is it just like yeah? Because he kind of turns back to confront them, and they just they just start leaving. Yeah, I mean, and that's and they bring him in to see who I done forgot. Well, we find out that Tiffany is there. Yeah. Tiffany Case is like in a little side room, and that's her and right. Bond kind of goes in there, and uh, they have a little you know sexy time. They have their yeah, they have their little sexy time. I guess like. Was she with the goons? I'm assuming she, I think the the, goon, the Slumber Inc. set up and Shady Tree and all that, and uh, Burt Zaxby was all working for Blofeld. And right. I think at some point she was too. Okay. I'm, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, yeah, anyway. I, think, I think you're right in terms of she was working for them, and I guess she just had them in the room and clear right. the room so she could uh, – uh, put her moves on. I guess she still assumes Peter Franks at that point. She still assumes right. that he is Franks and not Bond, which she'll discover later. And I guess kind of put the moves on him and use her feminine wilds, I guess, to try to seduce the diamonds yeah. out of him or the location of the diamonds. Yeah, you kind of get the idea that she's wanting to, hey, let's me and you just do this thing. You know, you get the diamonds or I'll get the diamonds since there's less heat on Tiffany. You know, she'll get the diamonds. You get the rental car. We'll, we'll blow this town. <laughs> yeah, and Bond talking to, to Felix before wanting the real stuff. I guess the real stuff they place at a circus yeah he's like you know have you ever been to the circus <laughs> <laughs> and so they plant the diamonds in a uh, like a some type of stuffed animal like you'd win at a circus carnival type thing right so they send tiffany there felix has supposedly got you know dozens of uh, upwards of 30 agents okay. on that floor <laughs> no way we're losing no it. way <laughs> and they lose her they lose her uh but yeah they've got they've got uh agents all over the uh the circus grounds she uh she gets a little note to like why don't you play the water balloons mm -hmm. you know the whole squirt the water pistol into the clouds. balloon fills yeah. up till it pops yeah. exactly so she plays that she the, the carnival barker hands her the little uh the uh, the teddy bear she walks off with it she uh, it slips through by going into uh, a very racist <laughs> Whoa. Exhibit. <laughs> Why do they dwell on that? They I, show the whole damn transformation for I some reason. I don't know. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It made me very uncomfortable. It had though. nothing to do with no. the, the, the movie or the plot or anything. I guess they had to pad out the runtime or something. And that dude's like, yeah, look at your amazing transformation. Oh, you'll be scared. Something like that. That guy killed me. And he's like, oh, if all this goes to, to shit, just run. If this goes to pod, head out to door, folks. It reminds me of uh, Dr. Zoidberg. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, if this goes wrong, just run. Yeah. Run, run for your life. And they show the whole spiel. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it made me very uncomfortable. The whole thing. <laughs> yeah, just it's a little sus. It's yeah, very I sus. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in the 70s, but it is very sus. Very sus. Very sus. <laughs> uh, but she escapes from the, the, the circus. Uh, she kind of meets up with Bond, I guess. He kind of, he wonders if she's going to meet up with him pretty much at that point. Like, yeah. will she just abscond with the diamonds? What's she going to do? But she does end up meeting up with him, right? Yeah, I think he uh, he goes to a little place that she had outside of town. He's sitting outside of her pool, and she's like, why is my black wig in the pool? Well, that's not a black wig. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's plenty of tools head. Yeah. <laughs> she's in there drowned. She got uh, the old cement overshoes treatment. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I guess... Does it explain who actually killed her? Was it Burt Saxby? Was it the goons? I honestly don't remember if they say who. I don't killed really her. know if it was. I mean, who cares? But like, you know, I don't think it's explained exactly who, who they are, uh, who actually killed Plenty of Two. But uh, this is where uh, Tiffany starts to learn that uh, Peter Franks is actually James Bond, right? And that the real James Bond was not murdered in an elevator by uh, Peter Franks. So uh, she kind of puts that together. He kind of lets her in on it. She starts working for with him and with the CIA out of fear that she'll be um, like 
maybe not fear, but uh, and basically working with them so that she can maybe get a lighter sentence. Yeah. Try to help them. Get a little leniency. Yeah, get a little leniency to kind of help the good guys. Um, I think it's at this point we head to um, the little complex. Uh, once we bond and her kind of chase. They go to, I think, where she actually dropped the diamonds. Right. And we see, I think it's Dr. Metz winds yes. up with the diamonds. In some kind of van. For, I, remember the, I can't remember the name of the tech company. It's like something W to Tech or something. W to Tech. Or some, w Tektronics or something. Something like yeah. that. Bond and her kind of follow that. Bond ends up in the back of the van. He kind of rides with Metz to that little facility. Take us through kind of what happens there. So uh, he kind of, you know, he gets inside the van. Tiffany kind of pulls in front of the van, you know, causes a little bit of scene to give Bond time to slip in. Uh, we go to W Tectonics, whatever it was called. <laughs> <Tectonics>. <laughs> they actually go down. They go down underneath. Uh, you know, he kind of gets out of the back of the van. He uh, sees another guy there. I forget what he said. It's something. It's, it's a weird name. He's like, he's there to check like radiation shields. And yeah. He's like, where's yours at? He's like, oh, you guys never delivered any down to our section. He's <laughs> like, well, I got an extra one here. Take mine. So. James kind of finds himself a lab coat, and he's already got his little radiation shield. So he goes into where Dr. Metz is, and uh, he kind of impersonates that guy. He's like, you know, I'm here to check Perfectly. Your... Perfectly, by yeah, the way. Yeah, to like what he would actually be doing yeah. somehow, yeah. I'm here to check your radiation shields, and that guy's just really, Dr. Metz is just off put by the whole thing. Yeah. James kind of notices this kind of little satellite thing they're working on there. And that uh, cassette tape. The cassette. The, uh, world's Greatest Marches. World's Greatest Marches, yeah. He which, notices that, yeah. Which will factor in. So he kind of gets... He gets kind of uh he he leaves the real doctor that he, or the real tech. He's like two minutes later walks right in. He's like, you know, an actual guy walks in to check the real radiation shields. Yeah, exactly. like, yeah, something's up. They sound the alarm. Uh, they start looking for Bond. He's just hiding behind some fake moon rocks. This is where we get um our famous moon buggy chase. Right. Infamous or famous, depending on depending on how you look at oh, it. Oh yeah, we get the moon buggy chase. Uh, to me, it's nothing. You have any thoughts on it, Todd? I mean, it's. It's very forgettable to me, honestly. I mean, it's just, it's a moon buggy running through the desert with a bunch of very primitive early three-wheelers coming after it. Yeah, first it's cars, and the cars can't make it through the desert, obviously. Then we get uh, guys coming up on little trikes. Little three-wheelers, yeah. <laughs> yeah very exactly. early three-wheeler prototypes, yeah. look like. <laughs> and it's just, it's a lot of nothing to me, honestly. It's just... Uh, very, very, again, like most of the things in this film, very forgettable. There's another chase later on that's as bad or maybe worse because it, <laughs> it literally goes nowhere. Right, which right. Which we'll, we'll trying to talk about. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, I guess we can just go on into that because, I mean, not much really happens here of note that you, that you want to mention before we really get to that next chase on the strip, do you? I think that's pretty much it. Then we go to that next. I yeah, think. pretty much. Like yeah. they get uh, after they get back in Tiffany's car. She's in like a Mustang. She's in this very bright red Mustang. Not very nice car. <laughs> not very nice car. Not uh, not very unassuming. No. Uh, very very loud car. But uh, yeah, they get chased. Uh, they they have basically Willard White. I guess put out the. Uh, he calls Willard White Doctor Metz. Mm -hmm. Calls him and has him put out the uh, the word to kind of like the share the local sheriff to be on the lookout for that car. Right. The cops all start chasing Bond. He's driving. They're going in. It seems like they're going in circles. I think they literally do at one time. I think so. There's a thing about, I think you see the golden nugget or something like three or four times, and it's like without Bond ever turning like he's going in a circle. <laughs> so that's the, my problem about the location in Vegas. I think if you made uh, Diamonds Are Forever, you made it better and you made it today in Vegas, I think it would be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But Vegas in 1971 was still basically a fucking desert. True. There's like not, there's not shit out there. That's, that's like my biggest issue with it too was the locations where they set it at. This is still back when Vegas was just like hardcore gambling, and that was it. Yeah, it was like gambling, <laughs> and you take somebody out there to murder them, right? And bury yeah. them in the desert. In the desert. I yeah. mean, you still do that, I'm sure. <laughs> but like, there's a lot more stuff to do other than murder. It's like gambling. all that worthless desert land Lex Luthor bought up in yeah. Superman One. That's, that's yeah, all I you mean, see. The location in this, it's like it's it's just it's a very early Vegas. I mean, yeah. Vegas was literally built out of nothing. It's a very early Vegas. So there's not there's not a lot of good locations, not a lot of good scenery here compared to the other bonds where you're. More more Eastern European, and I think you know part of that. I don't know if it's in my notes, but you know the kind of produ the production of this, they kind of saw the the profits dropping, especially in the U.S. They wanted to set it in a location that had a was U.S. based and locations that they could kind of 
for right. familiar to the U.S. audience to kind of get that dollar back in the cinema. So that's really your, your – and narratively, Las Vegas was included, I think, in the book. It was in the book. So they, yeah. they wanted to push it because they wanted that American dollar coming off of the kind of uh, – the the lesser box office returns of, um, let's see, what was the one before My Honor Majesties? That was... That was You Only Live Twice. You Only Live Twice. Mm-hmm. It kind of didn't get the returns that you wanted. Honor Majesty's Secret Service didn't get the returns that they wanted, and they wanted to kind of try to ensure that this got the returns yeah. that they were seeing from, like, Goldfinger and Thunderball. Exactly. And the, At this point, they're still chasing Goldfinger. They're trying to get that again. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely right. Uh, we get the, uh, I guess we should mention that car chase, the leaning car. The most... F- I guess famous continuity era in the Bond series, <laughs> uh, which is I didn't even pay attention. You tell tell me about that. So uh, it goes into the alley. It goes into a dead end alley, mm-hmm. and there's that little ramp there, and it's supposed to go up where the passenger side. It's on its left side. Yeah, the passenger the passengers down, the drivers up. Mm-hmm. But there was something oh. about they had to reshoot it a little bit later with a different crew of it coming out. It so when out. it comes out on the wrong side. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's some kind of sound in there that may, they, they try to trick you into maybe like somehow it shifts. But no, I, I do know what you're talking about. Now that I think about it, I know what you mean. Now. Yeah, there's yeah. actually a shot in there where they, and I don't know how they do it, but when they're at narrow alleyway, it's like, right? <laughs> so it can look like it's, yeah, they actually, right. they right. flipped the son of a bitch in car twice <laughs> on two tires. <laughs> In the same small alley <laughs> is what they want you to buy, folks. Uh, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, that, it kind of reminded me like of a, um, a much better scene that would come later. It reminded me of the Batman Returns. Uh, car, the Batmobile going through the alleyway. Oh, like, yeah, from yeah, Batman yeah. Returns. Like, right. It reminded me of that, just done much worse, much earlier on before that ever happened. But yeah, ah, not not good. But it now, wasn't, it wasn't now, good. Now I do know the uh, continue area that you're talking mm-hmm. about. Um, I think at this point, let's talk about, um, what Blofeld's actually doing. So I'll set you up for it. So like Willard White is a name that's mentioned a bunch of times throughout the film. Right. That's who it seems like these diamonds are supposed to be going back to. Right. All this killing and murder and the wind and the kid and doing all this stuff and chasing these diamonds are supposed to go back to Willard White. Uh, Willard White, that, that was his kind of tech company, I guess, that Metz was working for, developing this uh, diamond laser thing. And that's where the diamonds are supposed to go back to, was supposed to be Willard White. Yep. Um, he owns a hotel called the White House, <laughs> spelled like his last name, not like the actual location. Yeah, yeah. Bond ends up, uh, he's with uh, Tiffany there. They're in some kind of honeymoon suite. They've kind of checked back into like a honeymoon suite, yeah. They've got some kind of fish bed yeah. <laughs> that they're just they're staring at. Uh, Bond puts on his nice, you know, three-piece, goes out, uh, and he's got some kind of built-in grapple uh, gun suit on, some kind of spelunking uh, right. mountaineering suit on, under, like, you know, kind of cabled system wired into his actual right. actual suit. That's a problem with this movie, too. Like, the gadgets really here, not only are they instant-specific, they come out of no. There's no introduction of them by Q Branch. There's he no, just has them. There's no, like, hey, Bond, here, we're going to give you some fake... Uh, fingerprints for this and we built you a, a mountaineering suit and here's a mousetrap for your pocket uh don't put it in your don't put it in your pants pocket bond you know it goes in the upper pocket not, not your the lower, lower pocket. pocket uh there's that problem is they're, they're very instant specific but there's not even they're not even generated by the store they're just there they're there they just come literally out of his ass <laughs> <laughs> and and he's got this mountaineering suit on. He ends up working his way up to Willard White's uh, bathroom. <laughs> he, yeah, it's like it's like his bathroom slash observation room for the casinos. Yeah, there's a part where he's on top of an elevator, and they're just like, "Hey, Sean, stand on this elevator and try to look cool." <laughs> right. And he's like, he rides it up, and he goes in. He, he uh, apparently the vent could just pop open for his bathroom. He drops down into Willard White's thrown, literally thrown bathroom, <laughs> and then it's revealed. Oh, it's Blofeld all along. It was Blofeld all along. Exactly. So take us from here, Todd. So there's a, a nice little scene there because you see one Blofeld sitting behind the desk and another Blofeld makes his way in. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Another duplicate. And he kind of sits down on the couch and you're just like, well, you know, which, which one is the real one? But there's a cat there. And so old James has this idea, well, you know, if I kick the cat, it's going to jump to its master. Right? Which is kind of stupid because yeah. that's the closest Blofeld. Yeah. Of course it's going to, if you kick it at that Blofeld. Because the other one's way over there behind the desk. He's 60 yards away <laughs> at behind the desk. Of course if you kick a cat at the one closest, it's going to go to that one. So uh, James kicks the cat and it goes to the one on the couch, which he proceeds to shoot in the head with the the, uh, the python gun, you know. Yeah. That, yeah. 
And, uh, you know, it's, I guess it's the wrong one. It was, uh, the, wasn't the real one, of course. But, right. You know, and Blofeld says, uh, right idea. And James says, but wrong pussy. Because there was another cat there. They each had a cat. We I, see another I, cat coming out. I, I, I think I'm picking up what you're putting <laughs> down here, Todd. Uh, one thing to mention, too, uh, another aspect of this film that I hate, because it's one of those we're taking it into a, a unbelievable reality. Blofeld has a voice box. That sounds just like Willard White. Yeah, apparently they have some kind of implants in there. He mentions there's some kind of try to contrive setup for it that tries to explain it away. They, they put some kind of implant in for his doubles, and then he's got one, and he's got this voice box thing, and we see Bond using a version of it later. Sound maybe. like, uh, what was it? Uh uh, Bert Saxby, Bert Saxby, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, we see that, and it just gets into that unbelievable territory, just kind of like uh, crazy reality that this Bond field kind of gets into. But we should mention that because it does kind of make a appearance later. So Blofeld, uh, Bond shoots someone in the head with a grapple gun. Right, that and, one. And then Blofeld pulls his little revolver, and he's like, you know, get in the elevator. He yeah. doesn't just kill Bond. He don't just go ahead and plug him. Again, he another, can't, can't do that. He's all alone <laughs> with Bond at the top of a, a hotel. I'm Nobody sure, would know nothing. I'm sure no one's going to care. <laughs> uh, it's Vegas. I'm like, oh, somebody else getting murdered in this hotel? <laughs> uh, that happens every day. Um, so he shoots. Uh, he doesn't shoot, but he, he points the gun at Bond. He tells him to get in the elevator. Uh, and you know something will happen in the elevator. You know this motherfucker's going to drop, and that's what Bond thinks is just going to drop. Yeah, he kind of gets up against the edge because he thinks the bottom's going to fall if out I'm of it. If I'm Bond, I'm not getting in the elevator. <laughs> I'm, I'm James Bond, and I'm in a room along with Blofeld. No, go no goons. He's got one revolver, and i got a big open room with lots of things to hide behind. I'm taking my chances 1v1. That's right. Go me ahead and, and finish you, him off right you there. You and me, Blofeld. <laughs> I'm not getting on your fucking elevator. You can shoot me in the face right now, <laughs> but I'm ending this tonight. Right. Maybe, and they should have done that, and they just say, oh, it's a another duplicate and uh, have, have another one come they in. could have they yeah. could have but bond no he stupidly gets on the elevator they knock him out with some knockout gas right. and then he's back in the custody of hutan mr winton mr kid and how do they not kill him directly this time god <laughs> they take him out into the desert and put him into a section of pipe i guess they're burying for maybe a, i don't know water system what Here's your question. What the fuck is falls out of Bond's pocket that gets crushed in that trunk? What is that? I think that was actually, you, you see Mr. Uh, Went kind of put on this kind of like aftershave. He keeps spraying it through the oh. whole movie. That was his atomizer that he drops in there, and Bond kind of falls on it and busts his... Okay, and that's, that's why, why he's, he, he makes the comment yeah. about a tarts handkerchief, and that's why at the end of it he knows that aftershave. Right. I couldn't figure out for the life of me. I was like, "What is that?" Yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't pay attention yeah. enough. Like I said, I, I didn't care to. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah, they take him out, and they again they don't kill Bond. They take him out to some kind of construction site where they're laying some kind of underground piping, piping for something. I don't know what it's for. Um, and they put him in. They just put him in a pipe. They don't, like, conceal him in any way. They just lay him He's in. He's just it. laying in a pipe. And then no one that moves that piece of pipe. No sees a body in it. Sees a body <laughs> in it. And they bury him underground. And it's perfectly fused together around him. Looks like it's already pre-welded. <laughs> That's my problem with it. It's right. not like it's there. It looks like it's pre. It's like already been welded underground. I don't know how that stuff works. But they have, like, this uh, robot thing. And I, I don't remember the name, but it's called a pig. Mm -hmm. It's called a pig something, and it stands for like something. It's supposed to come through and check the welds of, okay. of that of that piping. Right. And Bond gets on top of it and like shorts it out. And like you said, he has that little interaction with the rat where he's like, one of us smells like a tall shake at you. <laughs> I think it's me, old boy. Yeah, sorry I'm sorry. That, old sorry about that, old man. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he ends up uh, shorting that out. That calls some technicians out to to uh, try to retrieve that little system and try to check on it and make sure it's okay because it's broken down. Mm -hmm. Bond pops up out of a little manhole. <laughs> he's like, oh, I was just out for a walk with my pet rat. And I got turned around <laughs> something like that. And I'm like, like, what are we doing what here? What are we doing what here? What are we even doing here? You know here? what it is? It's outrageous. It's <laughs> so mysterious. So outrageous. Uh, so <laughs> oh, that is that is that is Diamonds Are Forever in the Nutshell. Is that one scene? I was like, I'll out walk with my pet rat. And I got turned around. Yeah. Uh so uh at this point we kind of get um we kind of get I guess the explanation of what's going on now we know from Blofeld's little, let me tell you my, my evil genius plot. He's assumed the identity of Willard White. Willard White, they figure out, has actually been locked up in his little house on the in mountains. In his home out, out, out skirts of town. Yeah, yeah, they figure out where he is. So Bond and Felix and some agents start to head to Willard White's little compound to try to bust him out. Take us through that, Doc. 
<laughs> so we got to get out to uh, Wilder White's house, and uh, Bond's going up alone. He says, you know, give me five minutes to get up there and give me about five minutes to get down. <laughs> He's, and I think Felix says something about whatever, and he's like, I don't know, I'll let you know in 10 minutes, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> so Bond makes it up to the house. He gets inside. No problems getting inside. But yeah. once inside, he uh, meets up with uh, old Willard White's personal bodyguards, which are Bambi and Thumper. <laughs> are they his, though? Yeah, are they his, or are they are they, are they Blowfist? I would people? assume they had to be Blowfist, because yeah. I mean, he wouldn't... He wouldn't Realistically, That's true, yeah. He wouldn't realistically keep himself locked up there. True. I guess they, that was Blofeld's people, yeah. I guess so. I would think. But yeah, yeah Bambi and Thumper. What are uh, what are Bambi and Thumper? Are they a, are they a bunny and a no? And it's a it's, a, it's two uh, female gymnasts. Are they actually gymnasts? Are they? I mean, like in real life, I thought you had a note or something. I actually I, I watched a making of documentary about this movie, and I think I know one. I think the. Uh, so I think it was Bambi. I think she actually was a gymnast. I'm not sure about that. Because there's a lot of flipping. There's, there's a lot, a lot of, of needless flipping. There's a lot of flipping. Yeah. There's a lot of like, you know. Cartwheels. Kind of, and then like. This. The, yeah, the uh, <laughs> yeah the other. I don't. I think it's Thumper. Yeah, it's Thumper. She does a lot of. Uh, yeah, and it's like, you know, there's that one where she's like. And it's like. Yeah. <laughs> she's, I don't watching, know what she's, she's watching him. She's watching uh, Bambi like wrap her legs around Bond's neck. And she's right. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, right? what is going on? <laughs> At one point, one of them kicks Bond into a, a few big rolls of aluminum foil. Right. What the fuck was them that? Them things were huge, man. What were they? I don't even know what they're for. I mean, they're kicking his all, ass. <laughs> all this set decoration is like, what can we make that looks kind of like space age and futuristic? Let's get these big rolls of aluminum foil <laughs> and put them in the middle of the room right. and have them kick Bond into it. Right. We got no money. <laughs> So they're winning this fight, I mean, down, until they wind up in the pool. And uh, James gets a drop on them, manages to hold their head underwater, you know, you know, kind of drowning them almost. Yeah, and Felix comes along, and this is a note I had. Felix comes along, and he's like, oh, I should have known you were out here showing them the breaststroke or something <laughs> like that. And I'm like, this Felix is really giving off, like, Ralph Cramden from the Honeymooners vibes. <laughs> right. It's like, Bond, one of these days. <laughs> Bang! Straight right, to the moon. Right. Like I, he's just like kind of grumpy all the time. This Felix is. So you know he keeps holding him underwater until they kind of want him kind of you know get something like points down underneath, and they've got Willard White locked up kind of underneath at the side of the house in a little ranshackle room, I guess. And and uh, Willard White is played by none other than Jimmy Dean. Jimmy Dean. Don't confuse that for James Dean. No. Who was dead by this point? <laughs> uh, Jimmy Dean, Sausage King of America. Plays Willard White, right. and I was talking to you about this before. Uh, his whole character and the way he's playing this is just I'm mad. He's mad and he's pissed off. Bert Saxby. Bert Saxby. Ball hall. <laughs> I ain't got fucking <laughs> shit in ball hall, Bond. <laughs> like <laughs> he's just mad at the world. Yeah, he's just that's his one level. He's at that same level the whole time, and I'm like. Is this how Jimmy Dean really is? <laughs> or did they tell him just to like be mad? Because he's supposed to be like Howard Hughes. Yeah, exactly. Was, was that how Howard Hughes was? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Never met Howard. Not many people did, I don't think. <laughs> I don't <this>. think so. <laughs> Especially in those later years A where famous he just scuttled recluse. around his, right. his house. Uh, but yeah, he ends up meeting Willard White again, played by Jimmy Dean here, and just has one note, never lets up on that note. <laughs> Uh, they kind of take him and kind of explain what's going on. They take him back to W to T T T T W Tectonics. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and they take him back to there, and they're trying to figure out what the hell Blofeld was creating, what happened to it, why it ain't there anymore, how it how it works, where it went. They shipped it down to I forget where they shipped it to. Uh, he doesn't remember, but somewhere they can launch it into space. Mm -hmm. They figure out it's a big diamond satellite. And it's already been put into orbit. It looks like an old piece of camera equipment because I think that's actually what it was made out of, like some kind of like camera equipment. Right. And it looks terrible. <laughs> and it's like super weapon. It, again, Blofeld wants to hold the world for ransom. And I think he convinced that because there's a line later that with that Dr. Metz, like, oh, we're going to get what we want, disarmament of the world and peace, peace in our time. Like that kind of thing. And like, I think you just use that to kind of like sucker him in. Yeah. But it's just another blow failed ransom in the world. Exactly. It was, you know, first it was like whatever, capture rockets and, and create World War Three, And then it was, uh, let me put out this uh, virus Omega. And now it's let me make a diamond satellite and hold the world <laughs> hostage with right. it. Right. So uh, let's, let's, uh, we've spent too much time on this video. <laughs> 
<laughs> we gotta move on. We're like fifty minutes into this. I'm done. Uh, <laughs> let's go ahead and get to the third act of this. So, like, what? Uh, take us through our third act here. So we're kind of back up in Willard White's uh, main penthouse office, and they're trying to figure out, you know, where in the hell Blofeld's at. And Bond's kind of walking through. He had this like this big map on the floor of his office, like all the stuff he owned. And Bond's like, he could be anywhere here, here, Baja. And that's where we get the line, Baja. I got it, I got it. <laughs> I don't own anything in Baja. <laughs> I got it, I got to put it in this one note because I'm watching that scene. And Bond's like, Blowfrog could be anywhere from this state to this state. From this state to this state, from this state to this specific city in California. <laughs> Do you think it's this specific city Same in California? California? <laughs> yeah, it might be Bond. And that's where, of course, it is by Oh, California. unless we forget Blofeld leaving the casino in drag. <laughs> oh, yes. Tiffany Case notices someone leaving the casino with a white cat. You just see the like the arm white, and the cat. Yeah, yeah. She follows him out because she, she thinks that's uh, that's a little unusual. She knows Blofeld. Obviously, she's been working for him. She knows he has a cat. She pops or she gets pushed into his little limo. And, yes, there's Charles Gray as Blofeld in, in drag. Because <laughs> that was his only way uh, to get out of the casino, I guess, right. is to, uh, to be in drag. Not to change his face yet again or do anything else. No. Nah, just throw on a wig and some roots. No chopper to the roof or nothing. Yeah, exactly. I just imagine him up there like Buffalo Bill from like Signs of the Limb. (laughs) No, not Blowfam. Would would you fuck me, Mr. (laughs) I'd fuck me. Um, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> moving on. Moving on. Again, we spent too much time on this already. So we get choppers en route to an oil rig in Baja. And we see what? Something fall out of one of the choppers uh, by parachute. And I'm, I couldn't remember. I was like, how does, I had forgot. I was like, how does Bond get on that oil rig? That's and what I'm thinking. I, it's like, he's going to come by boat. Or the, I'm like, and then you see the plane. I'm like, we're going to parachute down. No, he comes out in a big hamster ball. He comes out in a big, uh, big hamster ball, proceeds to walk on water <laughs> <laughs> over to the oil rig. And, and here, here's where, you know, here's my, I guess my first big problem, you know. As much problem as James Bond has caused you already in this movie, if he shows up in a big ass hamster ball on your fucking oil rig and they call up, ah, Mr. Blofeld is Bond. Put a bullet in his head. <laughs> you throw him in the ocean. <laughs> that was my exact note. As soon as the little goons, like Blofeld's out, out there on the little mm-hmm. balcony, and he's like, who is it? And they're like, oh, it looks like it's secret agent James Bond, sir. Put a bullet in his face. <laughs> Like immediately, <laughs> as soon as they unzip that little ball, put a bullet in his right. head, and then just push the ball back out in the ocean. <laughs> I mean, obviously, do not entertain this man <laughs> on your oil rig. You can't do that. But you find out a lot with the villains in this series. They're very accommodating to Bond. <laughs> very they, accommodating. They bend over backwards for James, and they, Bond. they can't just kill him. In, 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 a, in any kind of normal way. They have to kill him in a, some kind of eventful or ironic right, way. Right, But, yeah, he gets aboard there. They, like, they search him. They find a cassette tape in his his uh, his suit, uh, his, the shoulder of his suit. Right. Basically, the control for that, the, there's a control cassette, which was hidden inside that great, the world's greatest marches cassette tape. Right. It's a coded cassette that controls the diamond laser somehow. Mm-hmm. And you need that for the for it to be controlled, and you need that for overall for the plan. So Bond's idea was to try to go in there and swap that cassette right. out. Switch the tape. One other note here, because it kind of how this plays out that I had. Um, blow f- the oil refinery in general, because it plays out. I'll, let, me, let me save this for a second because it plays out. Bond, he he pulls a little move. Tiffany's introduced. She's there. She, again, she's wearing almost nothing. Exactly. She's sunbathing. She's wearing a bikini. Yep. There's any excuse to get Jill St. John in a bikini. So uh, she, you think she's kind of swapped loyalties again. She ends up grabbing the uh, Bond's fake tape and slipping it to him. Mm-hmm. He uses that as a, a way to kind of. A pop out. He's and then I'm like, how secure is that? He lets him walk right over to the thing and punch a button and pop the tape out. I was like, oh, I guess this is where the little Cody cassette that, you... <laughs> that runs your whole plan is. And I'm like, I bet you could just pop it out like a <laughs> fucking cassette player. And yes, you can. He he turns one one hair on his head turns towards that cassette. Pop 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 <laughs> pop 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 pop. pop. <laughs> That's all I'm doing if I'm blood failed. You know what I mean. <laughs> I see his cheek turn slightly. <laughs> bop, 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 bop. <laughs> oh, we're not going to get done today. <laughs> we're not going to get done. <laughs> we're going to get done. No, 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 no. This is... Oh, gosh. 
I'm telling you, as soon as I see him make any kind of move. <laughs> and then when he's down on the ground, I'm like, hey, excuse me, can I have that gun? Uh, gun <laughs> you say that a say. <laughs> Just to make sure that we've done this seven times before. If you had diamonds forever, when we lost it and went off the rails, you won the pool. <laughs> This is the one that broke us. <laughs> Diamonds are forever broken. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let's pull it back here. But uh, he he switches out. He has the real tape now. They take him away back to again. They don't kill him. They try to take him back to a sale or holding area. He gives Tiffany the case. Slips it down the back of her bikini briefs and calls her. He's like, bitch. Yes, the bikini calls her bitch. You bitch. He slips it down the back of her bikini. He's like, all your problems are behind you now. Yeah, all your problems are behind you now. <laughs> bitch. <laughs> and uh, so she thinks that he didn't get to swap it because she kind of comes half into that little scene. So yeah. She thinks she's, he didn't. She thinks she still needs to swap it for him. Yeah. He doesn't realize that she. He'd already done it. She goes, and uh, once all hell breaks loose, because the military does end up attacking Felix and some agents ends up attacking the oil refinery, um, she tells Bond, I switched the tape. And he's like, you stupid twat. Or, you stupid, <laughs> Tart or something. Nah, like, you stupid twit. <laughs> I already switched the tape. And... Uh, so uh, she tell, they, he tries to, like, go back and tries to, like, fix that situation. But my problem here, the note I had about the whole thing is, like, the military ends up attacking anyway. Mm-hmm. Why well, send Bond in the first place? Because, like, once the military start attacking, Blofeld's just like, retreat. He's like, get my personal sub ready. <laughs> get my mafo sub ready. <laughs> I'm gone. As minute, The minute there is any kind of resistance to this whatsoever, Blofeld's right. like, I'm out. Why not just nuke that oil refinery from orbit? There's no other location. There's not like anything set up. It's to work way like, out to sea. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing around. There's nothing set up in the in the uh, the narrative of the film that says if you do anything to Blofeld, there's some kind of backup plan. The yeah. cassette's there. Blofeld's there. Doctor Metz is there. Everything to control that satellite is there on that oil rig. Blow it up. Blow it to hell <laughs> from orbit and call it a day. Yeah. Don't send in James Bond with a eight track of White Snake <laughs> in his jacket pocket. You know what I mean? We're not gonna get there. I can tell right now. We ain't gonna get there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, don't send oh. Bond in with a cassette tape in his suit <laughs> and uh, peeing all your hopes on that because, again, like there's no resistance. I mean, mm-hmm. they have some goons, but as soon as they start, uh, Blofeld is out. Bond ends up uh, getting control of the crane that's holding Blofeld's batho sub. Right. And he just starts slamming him into slamming the control room. Slamming him all over room. the side of the oil rig. Exactly. He just starts slamming him everywhere. Uh, he tries to get Tiffany to, like, grab a gun and, like, try to kill some goons. She ends up shooting herself off of the, <laughs> off right of off, the oil right rig. Right off of the rig. Yeah, as uh, as the uh, the choppers and everything are kind of bombing mm-hmm. it all to hell, everything explodes. Bond ends up jumping off. Bond and Tiffany get away, and we cut to our cruise ship now. They're on a cruise ship. Yeah, Bond and a woman, a woman also out to sea yet again, just not in the same way we've seen it before, right. but still Bond and a woman on a boat at the end of a field. Exactly. It's a bigger boat, but it's still, a bigger it's boat. a boat. It's a bigger boat. All right, Todd, we're finally here. Tell us about what happens on the cruise ship. Okay, Christ so... Christ uh, Almighty, we're, <laughs> the, we're over an hour. Can I get there? Okay, so Bond and Tiffany are kind of out there enjoying the night, just kind of relaxing, and all of a sudden we see Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd roll in uh, kind of posing as waiters uh, they're rolling in carts of food and they're like we didn't order uh, compliments of mr willard white sir <laughs> they proceed to go over the menu and i, I think the uh, the cake is called a bomb surprise yeah and tiffany's like what's very this? on the nose yeah very on the nose she's it's like, a what's cake this? bomb yeah it's like what's the surprise he, he's like that was that was for the surprise <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> So uh, Mr. Kids over there getting some uh, uh, some uh, food skewers ready. What do they call those things? Like, I don't know. I was thinking about that last night. It's like skewers, uh, shish kebabs. Shish kebabs. That's yeah. it. He's preparing some shish kebabs. Uh, you know, uh, they've had to. You know, Mr. Mr. Wynn is kind of popping the cork on the champagne, and uh, he kind of lets Bond smell the cork, and Bond kind of gets a whiff of that aftershave, mm-hmm. and he's like, you know. I smelled that aftershave before, and both times I smelled a rat. Yeah, they also <laughs> test his knowledge about the wine they're drinking. Like it's, uh, he talks about like that it's like not a claret or is a claret or something like right. that. And a real sommelier would have known that it was like made a claret or whatever. Right. I read something about the wine. Yeah, 
So he knows, you know, instantly something's up. And by that time, uh, Mr. Key has, like, got those shish kebabs lit on fire. He just, he's, just immediately. He's coming to kill James Bond with two meat shish kebabs. <laughs> If while that, <laughs> while Mr. Wynn has him behind the neck with like right. some kind of chain. chain, yeah. So Bond kind of is able to get the wine and bust it, and he throws it onto Mr. Kid, but sets him on fire. He's burning up to a crisp. He, he jumps off the side of the boat just to you know fall to his death. Really, he's gone. So right. it leaves Mr. Wint oh, to uh, try to choke James Bond out, and I was was assuming that he Bond got the drop on him with his chain, but mm -hmm. I actually realized last night when I watched it that he actually takes the tails of his coat, mm -hmm. pulls it back up through underneath but his behind really, really tight, mm -hmm. and Mr. Went really, really likes it because <laughs> so, he lets out this really, really crazy squeal. <laughs> and that'll be right here. Be, <laughs> insert here. And so Bond kind of uses the tails, gets the bomb, puts the bomb on the tails, cuts Mr. Wint a flip off of the boat, and he explodes. And let, <laughs> and let, 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 let me say, because this got to be addressed. So this, 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 cause it, it, we've been talking about it because we knew this was coming. We've been like joking about that scene coming for like mm. weeks now. That, <laughs> woo, woo, we've been talking about it because we knew it was coming. And, and literally what it is, because those two characters are introduced and they're, they're not so subtly introduced that they have like a, a homosexual relationship. Right. You see them walking off hand in hand at one point. Right. Um, at one point, they make a joke there on the airplane, and I think uh, Mr. Kidd is talking about the stewardess or something like that, or Tiffany Case. He's talking about Tiffany. Yeah. And he's like, oh, she's very attractive for a lady. Right. You know, and they're like, hint, hint. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing with Bond doing that, it's like he's getting the look on uh, Mr. Uh, Wint's face is supposed to be that of like almost a pleasure. A pleasurable. Look. And it's like one of those scenes also it just makes you real uncomfortable. It, yeah. <laughs> it's just. It goes by so fast and you're like, did he does? Yeah. Did I just see, see what I thought I that saw? happen? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, uh, again, this is a movie made in the seventies. It was a different time, but yeah, it does not hold up well as as lots of other things do not hold up well in the James Bond franchise. From it is this of early. its time. It is very <laughs> very much of this time. One other note that I want to talk about again: why why the bomb cake? Just <laughs> you see, Mister Kid, he goes under that little cart. Right. He lifts up and he sets a little bomb. That's where all you gotta do is have a little Tommy gun in there. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> If more crooks in these films used a gun. A gun. That's all you got to do. Just come up with a Tommy gun and just lay waste and just leave the scene before anybody gets there. It's a cruise ship. He's got a private suite. You could have dipped out. You already look like hell. So just hit him with a Tommy gun and be done with it and get the fuck out of there. But Cody, we would have never had no time to die or Casino Royale. I guess not. I guess not. I guess not, Todd. Uh, I just got to say, I just really, I really dislike, dislike this film overall. All right, Todd, you want some Bond bits up in you? Let's do it. All right. Uh, so during a late 1990s airing of the movie on TBS Dinner in a Movie, remember that? I remember that, yeah. Bruce Glover recalled that uh, while filming their scenes together, he and Putter Smith had Char Sir Sean Connery convinced that the two were actually openly homosexual. Glover added that a few years later, while on an airline flight, he was flirting with a stewardess when he suddenly heard a male Scottish accent and voice saying, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Glover turned around and saw that that man was indeed Sean Connery. Oh, man. <laughs> Beso uh, because of Sir Sean Connery's high fee, the special effects budget was significantly scaled back. Connery was reportedly paid $1.25 to return as James Bond, a figure unheard of in those days. Wow. Sir Sean Connery made the most of his time on location in Las Vegas. He said, I didn't get any sleep at all. We shot every night. I caught all the shows and played golf all day. On the weekend, I collapsed. Boy, did I collapse. Like a skull with legs. He also <laughs> played the slot machines and once delayed a scene because he was collecting his winnings. Nice. Instant mashed potatoes were used to replicate the consistency of the brown substance mud bath featured in the opening teaser. What the producers failed to take into account was that after 24 hours and under all those hot lights, mashed potatoes emit an almost unbearable smell. Oh, Lord. Uh, originally, this had been planned as a revenge movie, and Richard Malbum's original treatment for the script had Bond mourning his dead wife, Tracy, and vowing revenge on Blofeld. However, with George Lazenby's departure from the role, the script was completely rewritten, and there's no mention of Tracy and her death deeply affecting Bond. I would have loved to have saw that Diamonds Are Forever. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
Bond's escape through the movie Moon set refers to the popular conspiracy at the time that the real moon landings were fake. I just put that in there to say there's still people <laughs> that think the moon landing <laughs> was fake. That, that <laughs> still think they were fake. Sir Sean Connery uh, dated Jill St. Don, uh, excuse me, Sir Sean Connery dated Jill St. John and Lana Wood during production. The final Bond movie in which we see he is wearing a hat during the gun barrel opening sequence. When Sir Roger Moore took over the role in Live and Let Die, the sequence was filmed with Moore without wearing a hat, a tradition that continued with every subsequent Bond movie. Nice. Uh, this one's a little bit long, but I wanted to kind of put this because it ends in a funny way. So uh, bear with me here. So George Lazenby was asked to make a second Bond movie, but declined due to a lengthy and restricted potential contract. Burt Reynolds was the original choice to play him, but was unavailable. John Gavin was signed to play Bond in this movie and had recently played the French spy OSS-117 in the Euro spy flick OSS-117, Murder for Sale. Adam West turned down the role because he felt that James Bond should be a British actor. Coincidentally, West was first cast as Batman after the producer saw him play a Bond-like character in a Nestle's Quick commercial. Hmm. Michael Gambon turned down the role because he was, he said, in terrible shape and had tits like a woman. Okay. <laughs> at the last minute, Sir Sean Connery agreed to return his bond for the sixth time in a two-pitcher deal at an uh, astron- <laughs> God almighty, at an astronomical salary for the time. Albert R. Broccoli instead insisted that Gavin be paid the full sal- salary. Oh, my God, I can't talk, Todd. Albert R. Broccoli insisted that Gavin be paid the full salary for which his contract called. Nice. The original plot had Gert Frobe returning as Art Goldfinger's twin from Goldfinger, 1964, seeking revenge for the death of his brother. This character was a Swedish billionaire with a laser mounted on a super tanker. Oh. Would you have liked to see that Diamonds of Forever? Time? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Until Spectre in 2015, this was the last James Bond movie made by Eon Productions to officially use the Spectre criminal organization or the villain character Ernst Stavro Blofeld. The name Spectre is not mentioned at all in this movie as Blofeld is apparently operating Sand Spectre. After this movie, uh, writer Kevin McClory's legal claim against the Ian Fleming estate that he and not Fleming had created an organization for the novel Thunderball was upheld by the courts. Blofeld is seen but not identified in For Your Eyes Only as Eon's arrangements with the Ian Fleming estate at the time did not prevent them or permit them to use McClory's works. The McClory planned uh, unofficial Bond movie Never Say Never Again made use of Blofeld and Spectre as it was a remake of Thunderball. Ah. And lastly, Todd, this is the only Bond film in which Sean Connery's eyebrows weren't trimmed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> did you notice that? I did not. Did you pick up on that? I didn't actually pick up on Everything else that. going on. I kind of missed that one. Uh, we rank films on a 1 to 10 scale, starting from 1, the ranks are torture, 2, awful, 3, bad, 4, subpar, 5, mediocre, 6, decent, 7, good, 8, great, 9, amazing, 10, masterpiece. Todd, give us your final thoughts and review score for Diamonds Are Forever. Quickly, I just because I know we're running long, <laughs> I just wanted to kind of give a little spotlight on Sean Connery. Uh, you know, this was the type of role and the type of character that he played, that, especially in this day and age in Hollywood, you could have maybe saw him being typecast. Uh, Sean Connery went on to a fantastic long career. Uh, highlight 1988 Best Supporting Actor Oscar for his role in The Untouchables. Uh, I know we've kind of touched on a little bit. We thought maybe he was looking a little bit too old in the last couple he was in. Uh, Sean Connery was People Magazine's 1989's Most Sexiest Man Alive. In 89? I, in 89. Wow. I think he was 59 years old. Wow. So that shows what we know. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. But the guy, basically, he had almost two careers. I mean, he had mm-hmm. a James Bond career, which, you know, would have been successful enough for anybody. But he went on to even greater heights after that. So... I would like to acknowledge Sir Sean Connery. <laughs> and even lower lows in uh, LXG. Yes, the one that drove him away from Hollywood, <laughs> exactly. I do believe. Yeah, any any criticism, let me just piggyback, any criticism that I've had of this films, of the Connery films, are really not. Um, you know, you only live twice. Yes, he looks a little bit bored. In this one, I think he just kind of come back, and, I mean, he made a million, you know, over a million dollars. <laughs> I think he looked a little bit more agreeable in this one, and mm-hmm. I think he just kind of had fun with this one. Yeah. And just saw the absurdity in it. But my criticism of these films have never really been directed at, at Sean Connery. I love him. I think he's a great actor, and, I mean, I think... I think uh, he is still someone that uh, has a, I'll have a lot of respect for, and he did have a long and varied career. So just want to throw that in there yeah. as well. I want to do my review. Uh, Diamonds Are Forever, for me, misses more than it hits on a lot of levels. Uh, 
I think this is a film that would see more appropriate in the Roger Moore era than being the final official, official Sean Connery outing. Mm -hmm. A guilty pleasure? Uh, no. <laughs> yeah. But can I still find some enjoyment here? Uh, I do, and I think a lot of times it's just in the sheer outrageousness of it all. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I give Diamonds Are Forever a five, which on our scale is mediocre. Okay. I, I agree with uh, a lot of what you said there. Um, my problems with this film is it, it just it gets a little bit too absurd. We get right. into that definitely that that super spy era that we've been talking about and kind of dreading. It it, it would feel I think more in place uh, in the more era as you said than the Conneries. We've done six Connery films. Connery had six canonical official James Bond films. This is unfortunately his last true James Bond film, and it his, his <clears throat> excuse me, it is his weakest one, which is definitely a shame. But I try to look at it as a totality and, and holistically, as far as the whole series goes, it has been a series that's lasted over 50 years and has a lot of ups and downs and has a lot of varying stories. And this just kind of fits in there, like you said, that family reunion kind of analogy. Right. There's some that you, you really look forward to. There's some that you, you kind of enjoy. And there's some that you, oh, if I could just avoid this one, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll talk to them if I have to. And that's kind of a diamonds are forever. It's not a guilty pleasure. It's not something that I think is so bad. It's good. It's just it, it is kind of a it's a it's a it's a very mediocre subpar film and it kind of sits in there and there's not a lot of redeeming quality about it other than just looking at it as it's part of a series that has lasted so long and maybe it's okay once in a while to venture into the outrageous. Right. So for me, I give Diamonds Are Forever a 4 out of 10, which ranks it as subpar. Todd, tell everyone how they can find us and stay up to date with us on social media. We're at Tau Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tau Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at TauCapesPod at gmail.com. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please consider following us on your podcast platform of choice and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Popcorn Mumbles will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time, bye, guys. See you, guys. You dirty, double-crossing, limey, finkos, goddamn diamonds are phonies.